I want to welcome my dear friend who's got a heart of gold and is my inspiration, Ruth Bachman. Hands. Or hand, as the case may be. They tell a lot about a person. Take a look at your hands. Hands are the original and ultimate tool. Before AT&T, they were the way that we reached out and touched someone. <laughs> People can lend a hand. Some are described as being handy. Some jobs are so easy you can do them with one hand tied behind your back, which is the way I seem to do most jobs. <laughs> we fold our hands in prayer. I read once that the angels will tell your life story on your hands. And I'm confident that the angels will get my whole story. Take a look at your hands again. What story will they tell? At the end of each of your fingers are your fingerprints, and they are completely unique to you, as is the life journey on which you travel, a unique one. I have found it to be a mistake and even counterproductive to compare one person's journey with another's because all are different and worthy and one is not more important or profound than another. And so I begin with the disclaimer. I speak with a voice of authority. I do. I'm one of seven children and I guess I had to talk that way in order to get any attention. <laughs> But my authority, the message that I share with you today, comes from my life experience of not just going through, but growing through the narrow spots. About a year and a half ago, I was helping out at my granddaughter's seventh birthday. There were seven little girls sitting around a table at a tea party. They were having milk and juice as opposed to tea. Somebody did try tea and they didn't like it much. One little girl, whose name is Faith, happens to have autism, and she doesn't speak much, but when she has something to say, she does. About two-thirds of the way through the party, she looked at me as I had finished pouring some milk in her teacup. She looked at me and said, you only have one hand. And I said, yes, that's right. Would you like to know the story? And she shook her head. So I got down at her level, and I explained to her that Years before, even before Amy was born, I had something growing in my hand that was not good. It was called sarcoma. And in order to not have that sarcoma anymore, I had to not have my hand anymore. And that was hard. But I'm fine. I can do lots of things. I'm here with you celebrating Amy's birthday. Is that OK? And she said, now if she had been four, the next thing that she would have said was, will it grow back? <laughs> Four-year-olds say that. But instead, she said, I hope when I'm old, I don't get sarcoma. And I said, oh, Faith, I hope that for you too. And as I turned to walk away, I thought, I am not old. <laughs> There was a soft, non-painful lump on the inside of my left wrist that I ignored for about seven weeks, hoping that it would go away. An MRI showed a six-inch mass beginning in my hand, filling my wrist, and extending up my forearm. A biopsy brought the diagnosis of very high-grade malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Yes, I can spell it. That is the most common form of soft tissue sarcoma which is a very uncommon form of cancer. My prognosis was good, 40 to 65% survival rate, about 50-50 is the way I looked at it. When I went into my appointment after my diagnosis with my doctor, I said, I asked several questions, including, what is the acceptable margin of resection? Which means how much clear tissue do you need to take along with the tumor to feel that you have it all? And he answered 2.5 centimeters, one inch, all around. I knew that my wrist was full, and so did he. My next question was, 
And what will happen if I don't accept amputation? And he answered, you will die. He urged me to accept, to choose something unimaginable. To choose life without my dominant left hand. I knew that if I made that choice, I would accept something that was life-altering, disfiguring, potentially life-saving, but with no lifetime guarantee. I made my choice. And I am here, ten and a half years later, to be with you. Now, when I was diagnosed with sarcoma, I had never heard that word before. Never. But I certainly was familiar with the word cancer. My younger sister, Kristen, had died in 1991 after a reoccurrence of malignant melanoma metastasized into her lungs and brain. She left behind a husband and two small boys, not to mention me and everyone else who loved her. I now know cancer to be a very powerful and proficient teacher with the potential for profound transformation. At the time of Kristen's death, I saw cancer as evil. As I grieved her loss, integrating that reality into who I was and how I experienced life slowly but surely over time, my perspective changed. I'd like you to join me in a perspective changing experience. Watch me carefully. This is all you have to do. It's really not hard. Okay? You're going to start with your finger by your head and you're going to move your finger down by your heart. Just try that much. Finger by your head. Look at the tip of your finger. Bring your finger down by your heart. All right, now put it back up again. Now look at the tip of your finger and draw a small circle on the ceiling in a clockwise direction. Keep that circle the same size. Don't change your finger in any way except to bring it down in front of your nose and bring it down in front of your heart. And what do you tell me about the circle? You have to say it loud. Not smaller. We'll try again. Not bigger, not smaller. We'll try again. Okay? All right? Look at your finger. Don't let it get smaller or bigger. Draw a circle on the ceiling in a clockwise direction and bring it down in front of your nose. Keep looking at the point of your finger and bring it down in front of your heart and tell me what's happened to the circle. It changes direction. Up here it was going clockwise and when you bring it down it's going counterclockwise. A change in perspective means looking at exactly the same thing from a different angle to develop a different relationship with it. Adjusting and accepting the reality of amputation meant that I needed to reframe my life the way that I knew it. I needed a change in perspective. Slowing down, breathing deeply, and listening to my heart. Moving from my head, which was racing with questions. How am I ever going to do everything that I did before when I was left-handed? Slowing down, breathing deeply, listening to my heart. While my mind was racing with questions, my heart knew that just as I had done many other times in my life, I would face this challenge and that I would move forward. I had trust and faith in myself, my support network of family and friends, my medical team, and my God. I am a woman of faith, and my faith has made all the difference in moving forward in times of challenge. Has anyone here read the book Hind's Feet on High Places by Hannah Hernard? Oh, one hand, oh, two hands, three hands, four hands, five hands, six hands, seven. It is an allegorical tale written in a decidedly Christian perspective, but in my opinion, tells a heroine's journey. It tells the story of Little Much Afraid, 
an orphan born with two crippling disfigurements, who has been raised by her aunt, Mrs. Dismal Forebodings, in the village of Much Trembling, in the Valley of Humiliation. Much to her family's chagrin, Little Much Afraid works in the service of the kind, gentle, and strong Chief Shepherd. And she longs to go with him to the high places where perfect love casteth out fear and everything that torments. And eager to grant her wish, the shepherd chooses a date and a time and even provides her with two traveling companions and says they are good teachers, indeed few better. Their names are sorrow and suffering. Now, Little Much Afraid is a whiner. And she says, oh, come on. Couldn't you have given me joy and happiness on my journey? And the shepherd says, just hold their hands, and they will take you where you need to go. Little Much Afraid decides to embark on the journey and discovers that only by holding hands with sorrow and suffering is she able to achieve her goal. I have read that book several times in my adult life. And each time I have to get a new book because I highlight and underline and make so many notes in it that it's destroyed by the end. But it never ceases to remind me of what I seem to forget when I'm being challenged in my life. First, you must hold hands with sorrow and suffering. Second, images thrown on the screen of your imagination can seem much more daunting than they are in actual fact. Third, you don't always get to choose your path. Fourth, any circumstance in life, no matter how ugly, distorted, or twisted it appears, if responded to in faith, can be transformed. And finally, that you're never alone on your journey. I describe cancer as the narrow spot in an hourglass, and I'm the sand. I've traveled from the top through that tight spot to the bottom, the same sand, but with a different arrangement. Before my amputation, I met with two sarcoma amputees whose example was immeasurable and inspirational in demonstrating to me that life would, in fact, go on, and that there would be very few things that I would not be able to accomplish with the right amount of patience and persistence and grace. I am still confronted with things in my life that seem to be two-handed. And on those occasions, I'm given the opportunity to learn to do something a new way, to ask for help, and sometimes I just plain gracefully decide not to do something. Dr. Paul Pearsall, in his book, The Beethoven Factor, described th uh, thrivers as those who know when to hold them and know when to fold them. <laughs> he defines thriving as stress-induced growth that happens when we face a challenge. Cancer is a challenge, a narrow spot. Life is full of narrow spots, and they are not all labeled cancer. They indicate change. Change is the nature of life, and it is human nature to resist it. Small change happens every day, and we sometimes hardly even pay attention. The sun rises and sets. The tides go out and come in. We wake up after sleeping. Sometimes they surprise us like a beautiful rainbow after a sudden thunderstorm, but most often we hardly even notice. But what about all of those other changes that don't seem to fit into that natural rhythm of things? Changes in our family and personal life, in our work environment, in our health, in our finances, and more. All of that change comes into our lives whether we like it or not. We seem to think that we can control the way change enters our lives, but of course the opposite is true, and all we can do is choose how we respond to that change. Sometimes when change occurs, it's as if a phone rings and you pick it up and a voice on the other end says, Ruth, 
The world as you have known it is no longer that way. And wouldn't it be nice if that call was always from the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes? <laughs> Change is sometimes good, oftentimes bad, occasionally ugly, and usually accompanied by something called fear. A favorite definition of fear is false expectations <laughs> appearing real. Fear keeps us from being open and moving forward. It does not prevent narrow spots. You can go kicking and screaming, but you're going to go. The secret is to find some way to embrace that narrow spot and to move forward. All change represents loss of one kind or another, good, bad, or ugly. It all represents loss of one kind or another. And it requires attention, at least conscious acknowledgement, if not grieving to some degree or another. Grieving the loss of a dream or a goal, of a loved one, of a body part, of a position at work or in the community, of a prized possession. The list goes on. Grieving is a process of discovery and surrender and integration. There is no road map with which to travel. There is no neat progression from one stage to the next. But what the experts do agree upon is, if you do not grieve a loss, it will wait for you. It's not going to just dissipate and disappear. Grieving well the loss of anyone or anything is a spiritual skill worth developing. When you are confronted with a narrow spot of any kind, name it, talk about it, and gather information. That information will come from a variety of sources because narrow spots affect all five dimensions of life. In fact, there's a sixth one, that relationship one that I hadn't had on my list. I don't have six fingers though, so I have to keep five. <laughs> Cognitive, behavioral, spiritual, emotional, and physical. So seek out advice and comfort and resources from a variety of places, trusted friends and family, healing practitioners from a variety of modalities, therapists, a spiritual leader. And remember that wisdom has no age requirement. I have a very wise nine-year-old in my life, very wise. She's my role model for resilience. My granddaughter, my first granddaughter, born nine months after my, sur 10 months after my surgery. I spent nine months worrying about how I was going to be the grandmother that I always thought I was gonna be. How was I gonna change diapers? How was I gonna play patty cake? How was I gonna do sign language? How was I gonna make French <coughs> braids in a little girl's hair? And a dear friend said, that baby's going to make room for you the way that you are. That baby was born after having a thalamic brain hemorrhage, and she has compromised use of her right side. Together, we make a perfect pair of hands. Since the age of four, Amy has experienced epileptic seizures, which we always knew would be a possibility and hoped would never become a reality. This little girl has undergone brain surgery, way too many EEGs, and has deep brain stimulation. Her seizures are basically under control, mostly with the medication that she takes. In everything that she has gone through, she cries, and she screams, and she hollers. And when it's done, life goes on. It's all she's known, that's true. But to look at this and have that assurance that life goes on. And it's so worth living. 
She is, as I said, my role model for resilience. Now, we've talked about resilience a little bit, and Henry Emmons is going to talk about resilience again this afternoon. Resilience to me, my definition of resilience, is gathering the resources necessary to handle challenge without being overwhelmed by it. We all have the resources. And having a positive attitude, Barbara Fredrickson is another person that I have followed and, and um, read her research. Having a positive attitude is absolutely a key significant part of building your resilience. Some people come by it naturally, and I must admit to being one of them. But it is something that can be improved upon. That thing about focusing on positive things, three to one, if you said to yourself, right now, tell me three good things that have happened today, so far. If you can do it, it'll counteract a couple of those negative things that you might have been thinking about and dwelling on, ruminating on, having a positive attitude. It's not going skippingly like Pollyanna, Holly go lightly in rose-colored glasses, no. It is facing the reality of what is there and moving forward. Three questions to ask yourself. What is truly lost? What is lost? What remains? And the third one is most important. What is possible? In recognizing the possibilities, we absolutely have the opportunity to move forward in whatever circumstance it is that we are being confronted in. I have been told that I make life as an amputee look easy. I can assure you that life is not and has never been easy for me. I have experienced numerous narrow spots I've made a list, and I won't be sharing it with you now. <laughs> My narrow spots have been positive and negative. They have included crisis and disaster. They have occurred by accident and design. And in my response to them, I have stumbled more often than I have succeeded, and I am not ashamed to say so. I do not have the answers. Did you see that other set of quotation marks? <laughs> the answers for anyone, myself or anyone. There are so many questions that go unanswered. Poet Rainer Marie Rilke wrote, be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Do not seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. And perhaps someday, far in the future, without even knowing it, you will live your way into the answers. We seem to give and receive answers a little bit too quickly from time to time, most often because we want to get rid of that pain or trouble or sorrow or suffering or whatever it is. Just give me a pill to get over it, okay? But often, we need to learn what it is that life has to teach us. And it is very often going through the narrow spot that that occurs. When your sand goes through the narrow spot, it is refined and redefined, in addition to giving you a new arrangement. And it is in that refined and redefined sand that we very often find out things about ourselves that we didn't know were there before. And by paying attention to them, the next time our hourglass is overturned, and it's going to happen again, we have those resources that we discovered in the last time. In the Shaker hymn, to turn turn will be my delight, for in turning, turning, we come round right. 
Narrow spots are not fun all the time. They're not bad all the time. They're not ugly all the time. But change is inevitable. And transformation is intentional. There's a building in Eden Prairie that I frequent that has a, a, um, a high performance fitness facility on the second floor. It's actually called performance for people who do triathlons and marathons and stuff like that. <laughs> and on the stairway leading to this facility, there is a small sign. It says, there is no elevator to performance. The not so subtle message, you got to take the steps. We are on a journey. And every step along that journey is worth taking. Your life is worth living every day. And in taking those steps, we put ourselves in the position of moving forward and not just going through, but growing through the narrow spots of life. Thank you very much. <laughs>